European Movement UK is actually now in its 75th year. Um, it was founded in, in 1949 on Wednesday, February 16th, uh, 1949, actually in the House of Commons, um, about 90 or so uh, citizens and, and MPs got together in the House of Commons uh, to to put together the constitution of the United Kingdom Council of the European Movement. The European movement itself having been founded the year before, because essentially the year before that, Churchill did his famous speech in Zurich on, we must form a kind of United States of Europe. And that actually spawned a whole load of enthusiastic groups across the UK, but across uh, the continent as well, um, all over Europe, from socialist groups to right-wing groups that thought, Dear Lord, this is the future of our continent. We need to work together. Um, so that was where we were all born from. And the European movement in early days was actually behind the founding of the Council of Europe and the first charter that it adopted, the European Charter of Human Rights, first proposed by the European movement. Uh, the draft in French looks very much like the structure of the finished article. And throughout the years, internationally, but in the UK, it was a very much a cross-party affair of a sort of wake-up call of where we need to be as humanity. And this notion of not just cohesion of nations for mutual interest, um, but also the establishment of common principles and common human rights uh, that were guarded was not only a backbone of cohesion for the Western European countries, but was actually a beacon of purpose and hope for the Eastern European countries. The early European movement UK said they're part of the team. This is not a Western European movement, but this is a pan-European European movement. And there were lots of uh, in exile Eastern European representatives um, as part of that initial force. So, of course, European movement internationally down the years and down the decades helped form up a lot of the European structures and European movement UK were the intellectual force behind buying into a lot of that, getting us into the EEC, then being the predominant driving force in the 1975 campaign. By the time you got to 2016, European Movement UK had to step away from being the lead force in the referendum because in the previous years, it received some funding from the European Commission for some work. So it, in sensitive times, it's like, we need to step back and hand this over to someone else. But then during the People's Vote campaign, it was European Movement that pretty much became the main aggregation point for all the local groups, not just its own branches, but the other ones that uh, set up spontaneously. And so now, um, after the People's Vote campaign sort of fell apart at the end of 2019, European Movement UK is the, the hub and the hub and spoke model of the local groups, serving the local groups. Scott's very much involved in that and we want to develop that further but resourcing them um, and going beyond that we've also pulled in um, other groups from the people's vote days like infax we have acquired all of their sort of email list and and previous archives uh, we're working now uh, with with open britain um, and we're pulling together um, all the parts that over the year have built up the campaigning force that we are. And the membership of EMUK has grown rapidly. Just just a few years ago, it was about, what, like 5,000? Now it's 22,000. Um, so you've got a staff of 20. Um, you've got a much increased turnover, much increased capacity. And we've got various ongoing campaigns at the moment, uh, from Erasmus to the music campaign, um, and we will soon be pushing out in other areas um, as well. And it's really important for us, I think, at this stage to maintain the heritage of the 75 years and say, 
just like in you know the post-war confusion of like what's going on in the world what do we need to rally around actually the post-brexit environment is also quite similar not just because brexit is the very clear disaster that it is but because of the threatening geopolitics of russia or what could happen in the states and you know rising china where does the uk want to be in the world it wasn't a case that everything is stable and you can just go sailing out and you do your deals with america and you do your untapped deals with asia and it's clearly not working out like that so emuk needs to maintain that traditional british intellectual capacity to talk about new directions and forge them but at the same time get into the into the youth that are overwhelmingly pro eu all of the music all of the culture all of the opportunities all of the new businesses that want to emerge and help champion all of that as well so that's where european movement uk is and there is a thinking so moving on now to to the environment that we're actually in things are going well for us um in terms of where we want to go people are not saying brexit is a success far from it they're saying brexit is is bad and is coming in but quietly uh brexit brexit is bad it's not going well for us going further away from europe is not where we want to go the polling repeatedly shows that even on things like erasmus even conservative voters and previous brexit voters would rather see us go back into erasmus and you know and this is after horizon as well people recognize that we have gone too far away from europe and want to go back in the other direction and even the polling has switched now for you know over a year to the question not of whether brexit was good or bad but rather would you rather stay out or would you rather rejoin the eu and there you can see the gap opening also and you see that it's 60 to 63% very stably for rejoin over staying out and if you do the breakdown in terms of uh, demographics with the youth it's 80 to 90% so i'm talking about 18 to 24 year olds here but then it, it grades over age 18 to to 24 year olds are 80 to 90% it's it's hit 90% at some points for rejoining so in terms of popular demand it's clear that of the direction that we're going in the political parties may not want to move on that and we've been perplexed as to why but it's very apparent as to why and that is if you look at the the, the big metropolitan cities you have a huge number of people that are for a join once you get more further out into the country you've got a lot of minorities that that were previously mi minority advantages for leave so if Keir Starmer wants to win over sweeping parts of the north it's not about outright numbers per se it's about what constituencies you can grab and in order to reclaim a lot of those conservative constituencies you can't say we're going back to rechallenge this you have to say the tories have screwed up with things locally for you we represent you we like what you like we understand you and similarly even for the lib dems who are trying to take rural seats that voted for brexit they have significant figures have told me that they were doing well there until in those rural seats until tories started putting out flyers saying in yellow hi we're the lib dems and we want to take you right back into europe and so then they realized right the mood changed overnight apparently on the doorstep so they have to go to what they do best over time which is local issues local issues local issues but we all know where they are in the long term um and so their direction of travel is back to europe but the question is how far they are willing to drive that 
But this is where the European movement comes in because issues such as this should not be party political because also within the Conservative Party, I know the Conservative youth um, are more pro-EU than they are pro-Brexit. Um, particularly in the younger operatives around Westminster and, and Whitehall, they're keeping their heads down on the issue, but it doesn't align with what they want for their futures at all. But still, they regard themselves as conservative rather than uh, Labour or Lib Dem or anything like that. So if we want to get back in the EU, the EU also has to look at this country and say, right, are all the political parties aligned? Do you have a majority in the public and are the political parties aligned? Because we don't want to be playing hokey-cokey down the decades with one party takes the UK out, then another party, then the left brings us in, then the right takes us out and we're shaken all about for like several decades here. That's going to be a massive waste of our time. So winning the battle in the Conservative Party um, is important as well. Um, and that leaves some people feeling a bit flat. Oh, you know, when will that be? If, if the Conservatives lose the next election, then they're clearly going to go into a period of more madness and more right-wing uh, frothing before they come to their senses. Yeah, that's true. And so realistically, we do have to think about this as, say, um, a 10-year project. Um, so between five and 10 years, I mean, obviously it's not going to happen in the next parliament, but during the next parliament, a lot can happen. And a lot of people don't realize just how much has happened during the last few years of this parliament. Because if you take us back to just about a year ago, just over, you had in the House of Commons, the retained EU law bill being trumpeted as this bonfire of what was it, 8,000 laws that they hadn't fully documented, but something like that, were just going to get torched by the end of the year just gone, and then sort of we'd fill it in with radical new stuff that was clearly better than what 28 level-headed democracies can put together because we're British. And that was their thinking. And that was in parallel to the Internal Markets Bill, which was all about yeah, we're just going to rip up an international treaty. They can't do anything, but we're going to face them down on the matter of Northern Ireland. And that was the prevailing thinking until that actually got ditched with the Windsor framework, which then opened up the opportunity later in the year for Horizon to be sealed off. And there you've got the collaboration coming together now, and that's actually doing well and taking off again. And then there was a the whole UKCA mark, the... the, the alternative to the CE mark. Yeah, we don't need to go with European standards. We'll do our own. How are they going to be different? Doesn't matter. It's going to say UKCA, and you can still see them on lots of your bath toys and, pl well, you, I don't know if you've got like two and a half year old children, but I do. But you see them on the bath toys and the shampoos and the plugs still, and all that waste of money only to then ditch it because we're not going to diverge from EU standards. And then, uh, if you remember, there was that rule about we're not going to allow ID cards. Um, back, in, back in October 2022, we're not going to take European ID cards to come to this country. No, they're untrustworthy. And um, so we're just going to turn down half a million. Uh, no, no, no. Um, what was it? How many million was it? I think about 50 million people, I, I can't remember the number, but a lot of people across Europe were not going to come into the UK because on principle this, and they were warned about what that would do to school trips. No, no, no. O October 2022, they shut it down. One year later, October 23, after that industry had dropped 99%, they said, actually, new stuff has happened at the EU level and actually these ID cards are kind of safe. And so for school groups, yeah, of course, we're going to take ID cards. So just in the last year, there has been a lot of rolling back from the Brexit fantasy. And when uh, a Labour government comes in, and presumably it will, um, but even, even if it's not a Labour government, a next Conservative government, in order to save this economy, we'll have to make big moves 
in terms of uh, movement of people, particularly youth, um, rights of uh, musicians, other people trying to move goods and services through the market, exchanges like Erasmus in order to save our university sector. Lots of things are just going to have to happen out of a necessity. And this brings me on to the final thing, which is, so where do we go from here? Our strategy, European Movement UK, is step by step to rejoin. So we're saying very clearly, we're about rejoin. That's the end goal. We, we want back in, we want to recapture our rightful place. But we know that we can't just say referendum now, because we're not ready as a country, and certainly in the eyes of the EU, um, we need to have a, a good shower and sort ourselves out before we'd be invited back into the house. So pragmatically, we recognize that there's lots that we need to sort out on the national level, as well as lots of little deals of trust and facilitation and um, momentum that we need to set up with the EU. So everything that I described before is sort of part of it, but then we can push for more in terms of uh, the mutual standards, mutual arrangements, frameworks of defense and security, recognition of qualifications, looking again at mobility of people, then on to free movement, single market. And it might be the case that it goes from here to some agreements to single market to back in, or it might be that from baby steps, you then get faster and say, why do the single market thing? Why not go for we're going to have a referendum on the government's permission to just go and negotiate with the EU about a deal to bring back options to vote on? But, but basically, step by step, taking the wins, setting the direction and showing that direction works is the way that we need to go. And there's, there's a final point. There's a parallel to that, which is step by step in what we as European movement do in order to empower ourselves. So our steps are that we need to build up our media profile so that European movement is a household name, so that when people think about the European issue, whether it be media or people at home, they think, what's European movement doing on this? We need to grow our membership as well for multiple reasons. One, of course, that finances everything that we've, that we've got in terms of capacity. Two, it's a show of strength. You know, as you see that membership increasing, it shows more and more people care about this issue. This issue isn't fading away. It's building up again as a solution. But then also, in terms of strength on the ground, the more members we get in, the more that we can strengthen up all the local groups around the country so that they can campaign on local issues. So membership there is really important. So hitting the media, building up the membership, um, but then of course we need to build networks, networks with our politicians, networks with our businesses, networks with all the different representative communities of this country because the Leave campaign may have won by an inch and taken a mile, but because their offerings to lots of the different communities of this country weren't genuine, they were quick secondhand salesperson, car salesperson tactics. Those communities are falling through on them. Uh, the fishing community, the farming community, they've certainly got no offering for the youth who in the youth is, is going to hold up their candle, hold their flame and carry it forward down the generations and decades? No, they're not bought in, so it's going to fall through on them. We, in achieving our objectives, can't do the same thing. We have to be opposite to them. And we have to think about how we build in a way that genuinely involves all the different communities and their interests, weaves them together in a solution that can then be backed up. Because if you want to build something like this, you have to build it for all the right reasons and you have to build it to last. So that networking with, with political communities, business communities, 
social communities geographically and also demographically is really important. And that also extends across the continent to Brussels, to the capitals, and to the other communities on the continent with which we want to work. So there's a big, big project there. And, you know, Rome Rome wasn't built in the days is, is the common phrase, but when it's built, it's strong. And that's what we really have to focus on. And it takes a lot of hard work to do it, but you know in your heart that it's right and it's good and it's healing and that's the kind of thing that we all need in order to protect what, what we value in humanity and what we value in life. So, and with that goes all of the intellectual build that we need to do. And this is why I've been so focused this year on the fact that it is the, the 75th anniversary. We need to go back into a lot of the literature from the late 40s and early 50s when people were discovering this as a model that is that she come really, really good. Um, but we need to go back to those original articulations um, of people thinking about after a shock, after scares, your place in the world and what you can build that is solid and that is good for humanity. And I think that's really important because that's something that our governments didn't do about Europe over these decades. The BBC didn't do and they let us down on in discussions with Europe. And then when David Cameron called a general, uh, called a referendum, didn't do because he had a rushed four month campaign and it was all about economic threat. And even during the People's Vote campaign, that's something the articulation of what a good solid future based on British European principles should look like, that wasn't done because everything was, was you know, rushed by deadlines and trying to make other arguments. But now we do have more time. That doesn't mean that we should go slowly, but we do have more time to get it right and build it right. And for me, there's there's a fundamental excitement in that, in terms of really kind of building the world that you do want to build against a background, geopolitically at the moment, that we don't want to get lost in. So so that's that's the vision as it stands at the moment. And Open the questions. Who, who feels the questions? Thank you very much, Mike. <clears throat>